So again, this is the part of our worship service where we stop and think and taking take in what you God tells us through His Word. And this, the title of the sermon today is "Our New Identity and Loving Warnings." And the scripture reading will be read by uh, from it will be from Matthew five twenty one to thirty seven, and it will be read to us by uh, Gerald and Hedy Ardonado. Uh, from St. John's, New Brunswick. Uh, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and <clears throat> offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye <clears throat> causes you to sin, <clears throat> throw it out and throw it away. <clears throat> For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, Anything more than this comes from evil. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking with love and authority with your disciples. Amen. 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 You know, as we continue our journey through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we must not forget what uh, Jesus has told us before, has told his disciples before. And uh, we can remember that two weeks ago, we considered what Jesus said about those who are blessed. Uh, beginning with those, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who realize that they come before God empty-handed because they cannot give anything to God. They come with open hands to receive God's grace and his rich mercy. Because Paul wrote uh, that by his rich mer mercies, by his rich mercies, we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is our spiritual worship. So this is uh, we must remember all the the time that Jesus says, "Blessed are you," and this is something that we receive in Christ all these blessings. And last week, we considered the blessing of our new identity given, uh, given to us by Jesus. 
that he gave his disciples back then and he gave all his disciples uh, you know in, in subsequent ages including ours and he said our new identity was that we were salt and light in this world and during that sermon we asked the question do we have faith in jesus to call ourselves and say to ourselves i am the salt and i am the light of this world not because of anything good in me but because jesus says so that we are the salt and the light of the world collectively as a church as as believers and individually as people in where we are planted where we live and we realized as well you know that we cannot be the salt and light of this world apart from god living in us by the holy spirit it is his light that shines through us and again it is by faith it's we believe it because jesus that's the teachings of Jesus. And, and we come before God realizing that we cannot meet God's holiness on our own. In fact, we are sinful, broken people. And, and, and godly qualities of holiness, righteousness are all received by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote to the first Corinthians who were full of trouble. He said, that Jesus is our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And you'll read that in 1 Corinthians 1.30. So Jesus is all of that to us and for us. We look to him. His, it is his righteousness that we receive. And in other words, we cannot restore our relationship with God on our own. Jesus has to do it for us. And he restored our relationship with God when he came to the earth as one of us and he died on the cross, taking upon himself all our sinfulness. And again, we received this reconciliation by faith in him. We also read in the scriptures in the Old Testament that God prophesied long ago through his prophets that he would write his laws in our hearts and minds. And this promise, these promises come true as we receive the gift of faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And we participate and we accept it and we believe. And even if we are reconciled with God and that we have been forgiven through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our battle with sin does not end. In fact, sin is embedded in our very being. And an evidence, there's evidence that we have sin in, our, in, in us because we are being tempted. All of us are being tempted to be drawn away to sin, to live by our will, to live independently from God. And, and I realize as well that, you know, we, this is something that we accept in faith. And I know that it is not... Jesus doesn't flatter us. <laughs> he just tells us the way it is. And uh, we read about that in, in Romans, uh, where it's clear that we have the presence of sin, which is a reality for us all. We, we have the sin in ourselves still. And, um, and, and the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 7, 21 to 24, he writes, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And so um, we read that we have this, dwell, sin dwells in us, it's been defeated, but it will not be 
taken away completely until the resurrection of our body when we'll be given a new body. But right now we are stuck with who we are and the Apostle Paul had to fight this and we have to have this fight as well. It's a spiritual battle that we all have. And so, but we are not to despair because as we read uh, in the next verses that sin has been condemned in our flesh. And we read that in Romans 8, 1 to 4, we read, therefore, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. So observing the law cannot free us from the trap of sin. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And really the Sermon on the Mount is really about teaching us how to walk in the spirit and how not to walk in the flesh. Because there's a deep problem in humanity, in with humanity, and Jesus describes it very clearly uh, when he we see it, that's in uh, Matthew 15. And Peter said to him, "Explain the parable to us." And he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So really the problem is with the human heart. That's where we see, that is the root cause. What we see in our world, the brokenness, the wars, the infighting, the conflicts, those are all symptoms of a sinful heart. And Jesus comes and he gives us a new heart. And since, and since we, we have this battle, uh, we, we still have this battle with this sin that lives in us, but Jesus tells us very clearly, he acknowledges the problem, but he tells us how not to fall in that trap. These are what defiles a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So it's not what's exterior to us that defiles us, it's what's in the hearts. And, and Jesus, very clearly in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 26, he said very, it was prophesied that he will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of, and give you a heart of flesh. So God has created as human beings. We're going to remain human beings for all eternity. But we will have at the resurrection, and God is beginning this process now, but at the, the resurrection, we'll, be, we'll have this new heart where there will be no traces of evil at all in any of, of us. All the ones that are in the fullness of the kingdom of God. So during today's sermon, there's so much and that I cannot, we cannot go through all the Sermon on the Mount and the scriptures that we read. But we're going to stop and think about anger and lust, the first two that Jesus mentions. And so, you know, he, he begins to talk with about anger. And the problem with anger, it's, it, it's when it's, it, it's simmering and, and, and when it's nursed and when we feed it. And this is what Jesus said. And you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, 
but whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So in this Bible passage, Jesus addresses the problem that causes murder. Murder, murder is a symptom of a very sick heart. And so Jesus goes right to the root of the problem and he addresses the, the problem from that point of view. And he tells us very clearly in this verse that we are not to nurture such anger. And anger is a common emotion. Anger in itself is not a sin. And we all feel and experience it at times. I don't think there's anyone, I know there's no one here who can say, well, I've never been angry in my life. Uh, we all have experienced this. And um, Jesus expressed his anger and did not sin. And there are several causes for anger. Uh, some of the causes of the anger may be when we feel threatened or attacked, uh, when, we, when we feel that we're treated unjustly, when we feel that we are disrespected or degraded or dissed or belittled or insulted, you know, we can get, we get, ang we can get angry at that. Or when someone takes something that belongs to us. And again, you know, we can feel angry at this and it will not always, it, it's, it's not a sin, but it can become a sin. And it does begin, be, uh, uh, be, become a sin when we linger, when we don't forgive. And, and anger may be expressed in, in different ways. It uh, may be expressed in a very passive-aggressive uh, passive way, such as sulking or grumbling or pouting. Or it may be open aggressiveness when a person screams or attacks with words or hits. Or anger can be expressed assertively, which is a healthy way of expressing it. Uh, it's a more mature way. It means that you know, we can take ownership of our anger and we deal with the problem rather than attacking the person. And that takes maturity to be able to do that, to do that in a, in a loving way, not out to destroy anybody. And so the, the word anger that Jesus uses here is a word that is spelled O-R-G-E, orgy, and it's a fixed anger one that we will not let go. It is the type of anger that is nursed and, you know, we just feed it and we, we don't want to let go of it. And of course, when we feel this type of anger, we do not forgive. We want to get even. And, uh, you know, it may be a real offense. It may be a perceived offense. But... This is real anger that, that is there and that we nurse. And this is the first degree of anger that Jesus describes here. And this type of anger, Jesus said, and he uses analogies that meant something for the people who were listening to him at that time. He said, this type of anger is liable to the council, which was a type of judgment court. And uh, so he just shows that this type of lingering anger is sinful. It has to be dealt with. As William Barclay says in his daily Bible study, so Jesus for, forbids forever the anger which broods, the anger, the anger which will not forget, the anger which refuses to be pacified, the anger which... Uh, seeks revenge. If we are to obey Jesus, that kind of anger must be banished from our lives. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, if I forgive, I need to, I need to forget. Well, the, we can, we, we can remember the hurt that we've received. And, and of course we will remember it. It sticks in our minds. It's, you know, that's the way our, our bodies, our, our brains are, are made. 
but it doesn't mean that we have to stay angry. We can still forgive and remember. But the, that emotional package that goes with the memory is not there when we forgive as we have been forgiven in Christ. So, and, and Jesus goes on that there's an anger which is even more problematic because sinful anger is like a cancer. It grows, it infests, and if not treated, it leads to death. So Jesus says, well, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And I will read a f uh, two more uh, translation. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. That's from Matthew, from the New American Standard Version, Matthew 5, 22. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council in Matthew 5, in, from the King James Version. And that word, Raka, means somebody who is empty-headed. And this term expresses contempt. Viewing the other person as stupid, a numbskull, and you know, you just look down on the other person with feel like spitting on them. And uh, and so it, it can mean, you know, like calling somebody a brainless idiot, a silly fool, and all these types of words that we have uh, in our modern language. So it, it means that we are looking at people with disdain, with scorn. And what Jesus is saying is that this sin of anger is bad. The sin of anger is bad, but the sin of contempt is worse, if you will, because it just it's just a step above the lingering anger. It, it just develops into something else. The Apostle Paul, of course, if you remember, tells us very clearly that we are to see others through the eyes of Jesus. And you can read about that in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 26. Because he says, because Christ has died for everyone, he, he, that's what we believe. He died on the cross and took upon himself the sin of everyone, mine and yours, and that of everybody else. And it, it, Paul says, for now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So we regard no one. We don't regard Jesus with our unconverted eyes, and we don't look at other people through unconverted eyes either. <laughs> um, because, you know, Jesus loves these people. And he died for all of us while we were still his enemies. So we are to, to be reminded that all people are created in the image of God. And we need to remember that it's God's desire that everyone come to repentance and knowledge of the truth in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. And this contempt, and you know, sometimes, you know, when there are big problems in marriages. It, it goes from anger then to contempt and you just have a disregard for your spouse or or maybe it's your boss or it's maybe it's your neighbor and you just look as at them as complete losers and and and, and uh, but as bad as that is and it's bad it's a sinful and it hurts people and it hurts the people the person who has this lingering anger is hurt by it and it hurts other people. There's the love of Christ is not in that. And it's, it, it gets worse. It gets worse. Because then it leads into action. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell, Gehenna of fire in Matthew 5.28. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go to the fiery hell. In Matthew 5, the New American uh, Standard ver Version says. And Jesus goes on to speak of the man who calls his brother moros, a moron. Um, he, 
he calls his, this man a moral fool, if you will. He, he, it, he attacks the character of the person, um, just attacking his morality, attacking his, it, it, it's the worst that he can think of. It destroys the other person's reputation. That's what it does because usually when people feel that kind of anger, they don't, they don't keep it to themselves. They want to share it with others. And, and as we look at this, you see, Jesus is telling us, is warning us that in Christ, we are not to fall into that trap. He's, he's, because Christians can fall into that trap. I have seen people, and you have as well, I'm sure, who call themselves Christian and they're, who are so angry and who belittle other people. And pro I'm sure we have, none of us is, is not guilty of that. We, we have done that to some degree or another. But as we grow in Christ, we don't want to go there anymore. We don't want to call people. We don't want to look at people with contempt. We want to look at them as, you know, this is my potential brother for eternity, my potential sister for all eternity. Because you never know how God works with people. You know, last night we, Edna and I were watching a, a movie. And it's the story of a young married woman who was a teacher. And she was accused of having sexual relationship with her, her, one of her students. And the whole thing was a fabrication by false. And she did things that were not wise. She didn't set clear boundaries. But she, in her naivety, in her naivete, she wanted to help students. And she was a very beautiful woman. And of course, you know, there was jealousy and everything else, and it had to go to court. And she was found not guilty because she was not. But in the process, her her reputation was destroyed. She was an excellent teacher. She cared for her students. She went beyond uh, to help them, and that's what got her into trouble because she didn't set the, the proper barriers. But she could never teach again. And it was based on a true story. And what saved her was a lawyer who believed her and her husband who loved her through it all. But her, her reputation as a teacher was still destroyed. And, you know, gossip does that, doesn't it? And uh, so that is, Jesus says, you know, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So it's a very, very serious problem. And when we are not to fall into that, and um, in Ephesians 4, 31, Jesus tells us very clearly that we have control over that by the Holy Spirit. Because he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. In a few words, the Apostle Paul describes what Jesus has been saying. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And again, what happens is that we anger when it leads to bitterness, just infects other people as well. Because when we are bitter and resentful, people know about it, and you, you want to tell the world how bad the other persons are. And uh, so it, it's a uh, it's 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 like this kind of anger. I suppose it's like a, a a rogue wave or a tsunami that destroys along its path. And we're God has never created human beings to have those kinds of relationships. God has created human beings to be to love Him first and to love others as we love ourselves. That is what that is God's intent for us. And so when we begin to fall into these things, we need to go to God and say, God, you know, I'm, I have these attitudes, I, and we have to admit it to ourselves and admit it to God and ask God for forgiveness, to confess our sins. We're already forgiven at the cross, 
but Paul, God wants us to admit those things to him for our benefit, to be able to leave it behind. And murder, you see, is really of the heart. And I like what Barclay says in his daily Bible study. He says, long-lasting anger is bad. Contemptuous speaking is worse. And the careless or the malicious talk which destroys a man's good name is worse of all. The man who is the slave of anger, the man who speaks in the account of contempt, the man who destroys another, des destroys another good name, another's good name, may never have committed murder in his action, but he is the murderer at heart. So, what God is telling us is is serious, and uh, you know, the good news is that even if our outside is getting old or getting sick or whatever, depending on whatever age we are or just the process of living, God is creating us in us a new, giving us a new life. And he, that new life, that is the one we will have at the resurrection, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15. And I encourage you to read that. It's such an encouraging chapter as well. And then he goes on to adultery. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. But each person is tempted. Okay, let's just go back. Um, again, Jesus goes to the, the root of adultery. He is addressing the problem in the context of a union, uh, uh, in the context of a, a union between a man and a woman. And we see that in verse 31 to 32, because Jesus addresses the topic of divorce right after. A and Jesus is interested in what is happening in our minds and hearts. You know, in the Old Testament, there were clear commands not to commit adultery. And we read that, for example, in Exodus 20:14 where it says you shall not commit adultery. In the Old Testament, it describes the action. In the New Testament, Jesus describes the heart behind it. And the problem, of course, is not looking at a woman. The problem is looking at a woman with lustful intent, Jesus was telling his disciples. You know, because any man can find a woman and see her beauty. He can see her quality without lusting. Lusting means that one has a very strong desire for something. And in this case, a very strong desire for sexual desire, a craving that is first entertained into the mind and the heart. And of course, it's not only, it does not only apply to men, it can apply to women. In, in Jesus, in James 1, uh, in verse 14 to 15, we read, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is, has conceived, gives birth to, this, to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You know, because sin inhabits our bodies, as we have read in Romans, we are going to have sinful thoughts that are going to go through our minds. You know, that's a reality. We all have them. We don't like them, but they're there. So how do we deal with them? Well, we need to deal with them by acknowledging that they're there. But we are not to feed them and entertain them. You know, like in our minds every day, there goes thousands and thousands of thoughts that goes into our minds. And if you want the uh, comparisons, it's like a trains going, going uh, through our minds. And we have the choice of, uh, let's say that these are temptation, uh, wrong thoughts. We have the choice of getting on the train or letting the train go by. So what we are to do is to let the train go by. We acknowledge the train is going by, but we don't embark in, in it. 
And the Apostle Paul is 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war against according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but his, have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are those strongholds? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So when sinful thought come into our minds, rather than feeding them, we are to remember the word of God. We are to ask God to help, help us say just a private thought, a private prayer. God, I don't want that thought in my mind. It's there. And you replace it with the word of God. And in our world, our world feeds that kind of lusting, doesn't it? Uh, you see it in advertisement. You see it in movies. You see it in social media and pornography. It entices people to sex sexual lust. And we live in the reality of this world. But with the mind of Christ in us, we realize that adultery is a selfish act. It's devoid of the love of Jesus. And you see, God looks at the heart. Even if, we, it, it, if it's never go, it goes into action, feeding that kind of, of thought is sinful. It's like committing adultery. It is committing spiritual adultery. And lust and illicit sex hurt the adulterer, hurts the adulteress, it hurts children, it hurts extended families, it hurts cities, and even countries. And we saw an example of that in one of the major cities in, in, in the country yesterday, where a man fell to, to, to adultery. And it's, you know, because sin has serious consequences. It doesn't respect whether you're rich or poor. It affects everybody. And sometimes you can hide it for a while. But in time, God is going to expose it. And we, we need to remember the many things that the Bible teaches us about who we are. Again, he tells us you are salt and light. Let, and that we let his light uh, be reflected in us. Do we always live by these ideals? No, we don't. But as we grow in maturity in Christ, we will grow in these qualities. God will make those qualities grow in us as we participate in him. And with the love of Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit, we realize that others are to be loved and not used as a means of to satisfy our passions and selfish desires. With the love of Christ in us, we do not want to hurt other people intentionally. And the, 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 the utmost example is Jesus Christ when he was on the, on the cross. He said, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And so this is the mind that, that God dwelling in us, he, he helps us to grow in those qualities of love. And it calls for, for a decision. It says, if your eyes causes you to sin or makes you some, uh, stumble, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin or makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Again, you know, God is not telling us literally to tear out our eyes or throw away or cut our hands. That's not it. He, he wants, it's an, it's an emphatic exhortation to avoid and remove everything and anything that causes us to stumble. 
Because the not doing so, Jesus says, has severe consequences. And when he talks about that your body, your whole body going to hell or Gehenna in, in the original language, you know, that's a place of destruction. Um, Gehenna refers to the Valley of Hinnom, which is located outside of Jerusalem. And we read about it in several places in the Old Testament, but uh, Ahaz, for example, worshipped there and the Israelites offered their children as sacrifices to, to, to the god Molech. And you'll read that in 2 Chronicles 28.3. And later on, as time progressed, it became, became a place where rubbish and garbage were brought and burned outside Jerusalem. And it became a symbol of God's destroying power of where people who rejected Jesus and his lordship would end up. So it has serious consequences. And in all these scriptures, we need to remember that Jesus is telling these things to us out of love so that we will not fall into those traps. And with his help, he enables us to be able to not go there in serving the flesh. He tells us how to live in the spirit very clearly. And as God's people, that's what we are to, to aim for as we seek God, as we read in, in, in Psalm 119 uh, this morning. And God is in the business of healing the human heart. And he heals us as we live united to him in faithful obedience. It's all of God. You know, he is the one who heals us as we obey and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are told in Philippians 2. Why? Because it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So all the glory goes to God because he is the one who has set us free from, from sin to serve him. But he knows our weakness and he, he, he tells us don't go there because the way of sin is destructive. Don't go the way of the flesh. And this is what the apostle Paul, the, all the apostles and subsequently his church were told to teach. Uh, as we read the last verse in, in, in Matthew 28 of the Great Commission, he tells the church, he tells the apostle and the church subsequently to teach people to observe, to guard, and to keep unchanged what God has commanded them. And so I know that this is, God is teaching us. He goes right to the heart of the matter. He has that ability. And we can thank him today and every day for his loving concern in teaching us to live in a way that glorifies him and for teaching us a way of godly love, love towards God and love towards neighbor. And one day we will experience the fullness of that promise at the return of Jesus. And not for a day or two, but for all eternity. Amen.